Sorry to keep you away tonight. We lost Matt Taylor. Hello. Hello. Yeah. So we lost Matt Taylor for a little bit, but we found him now. So he'll be with us in a, in a few seconds. Um, thanks ever so much for coming this evening. Um, all, always good nights on the first forum of the 22 23 season. I know it's a big night for the England ladies. Women's, beg your pardon, women's team. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll tie up in, in, in lots of time for you to be able to, to watch the game. I think we're having it on the screen. Yeah, but you, you've got to finish by 5 to 8. You know? I've, got to finish, I've got to finish by 5 to 8, which means that you can't ask me any questions uh, at, at the end. So that fits me just fine. Have we lost him have we lost Matt again? He's coming. Okay. <laughs> So we'll just be a, be a few seconds and, and then we'll, we'll get started and I'll hand over to Craig. So the way tonight will work is uh, we'll get Matt Taylor in first and start asking the questions because Matt probably fell off this interview every week. Up a little bit. And then um, Matt will take some questions and then Sam starts out to find will come in and we'll do the same again. I'll ask them the questions and then you can have your say. Um, and yeah, then Nick faces your brand after that. Uh, and then Mike says, well, we'll have to keep the game on here, just to say. But yeah, um, welcome, Matt. Thank you. 
So yeah, uh, get your questions ready for Matt shortly, but uh, we'll start with Q&A, uh, Scott. So um, yeah, we'll hand over to Scott and get going. I assume the applause was for me then, not Matt, but <laughs> always for me. Um, it's nice to see everyone here this evening. Feels like we haven't had many of these since COVID times. Not too many, it was obviously a difficult 18 month period. Um, it was close to normality with possibly having that. How are things around the club and training ground post COVID, if we can call it that? <laughs> Moving in the right direction. Uh, anyone who's been out past the training ground um, will know it's a bit of a building site at the moment. Uh, foundation to go in, in place, ready for the the new blocks which come in October, we turn into a new train ground building as such. Um, so there's a lot of dust. Um, I think it feels like the work of working when it's awfully hot. And um, it's bad luck watching the players play like the plant love the work. Um, but there's real progress being made um, in relation to COVID bits and pieces. We've had one or two cases and one or two probably with longer COVID um, in terms of the spirit of bits and pieces for pre season. But nothing with the object we think will affect us throughout the season. And I guess the best place to start probably would be just looking back on last season. You know, the most successful season of your management career so far, the best season we've had in 10 years, really, or, or longer. I mean, how was it for you as a manager? Um, pleased to see the group develop and um, pleased to see the young players grow into the players that they've become. Um, I think we got the blind blend as, as spot on as we possibly could last season. But the balance of the team was fantastic. The first time in my career. We were able to improve as the season went on. And obviously, when Sam comes out, as uh, no means uh, a large part due to this um, in terms of fitness. But the, the group was grew and grew and grew. Um, the first season with the fans back in the stadiums felt different. Um, and straight away from the first day of the season, despite us growing that game against Bradford, we just sensed a feeling of anticipation. And then we went on a fantastic platform, got some fantastic results along the way. And second half of the season, the boys were fantastic. We lost four games post post the New Year fixture at Sutton. Um, and within that time, we put an awful lot of games. We almost turned those those draws first half of the season, those frustrating draws into wins. Um, but all by tight margins, and those margins were so so small, um, and that was fine. But it, simply due to the fact that the players could always find an extra little bit within themselves, uh, and we added some quality to the group on top of the foundation of of the young players which have been our mainstay for years. And when was it for you that you felt that something good was going to be achieved here? When could you tell that you know we we're heading in the right direction? But we could see the potential when we had got the group together at the start of the season. Um, we knew that when Sam in terms of fitness, when whenever that other person that within the group um, started to show their form and uh, started to feel settled as well, um, what we could achieve if we kept them fully fit and firing throughout the season. We had a certain profile of long player for the second half of the season to almost give us depth to the squad and then we didn't have to change too much. So when Hombe was out injured, we were able to bring in Sanzala. Um, when Javari was out, then Kevin Phillips would play top of the pitch. Um, probably the Hombe was always a, an experienced option as well. So we recruited to a certain profile and a certain identity. And it always meant we didn't have to change too much, even during the games. And even when we were chasing the game. So the second half of the season was the most pleasing factor. And as it grew closer and closer towards the end, the group seemed to get stronger and stronger, um, and some players can buckle under pressure. That group last season seemed to grow under um, some of these relations that because they got where they needed to get to. I think we all saw how important last season that sort of squad to make togetherness was as well. Such a good you know, group that all got on. I mean, how big do you think that was towards us getting promotion? It's huge. We, we do our due diligence when we bring in players, um, the character references we get, uh, the player references as well, uh, everything we can in terms of the, it was actually Zoom calls, but it was still a little bit of COVID time and then those individual meetings just to gauge their personalities. But that's on a, a hard, fed on a foundation of young players. And last season we had probably between five, six, possibly more than that, the match day squad and even on the pitch as well. So you've always got your XSC identity. And then we added a little bit of quality, a little bit of experience on top of that. Um, and, and the group just gelled together and they're a fantastic group to work with. Always gave it all. And some of those games I've touched upon the second half of the season. Uh, and they're having a game where we're games where we're level or behind. We found a way to get back in the game through team spirit and fitness and found a way to be successful. I think you mentioned to us at the end of the season, but Sarah, your wife, played quite a crucial part in those Zoom interviews and that with the players. <laughs> she was crucial in getting Jamali Brown to join us, I believe. Oh, well, it was very silly because um, she got married last year. Um, I mean, apart from even we were going away in terms of road, so I think when Cornwall went on speaking to various players on the Zoom calls, and then in a couple of days towards Ascot, and obviously met Giovanni on one of those days. Um, so she wasn't particularly happy with it at the time, um, as you can feel on the moon. Um, and certainly in terms of how busy you are the rest of the, the season. Um, but then maybe that made the players feel a bit more settled. Um, they could see my identity, they could see who I was. They got a better feel for myself in the football club. 
and you were a family book, you were a community club. And so hopefully what she played, she played a part. You know what I mean? She probably didn't. <laughs> and for you, how does this achievement rank in your career? You know, successful playing career, moved into management, and you know now you've got a promotion after a few seasons. Yeah, look, it, it's, it's certainly up there. Um, it, it's tough because uh, it's just, you've always got to do something different each and every year. And um, whether that's the first season, you're going to replace Paul who've been in such a long period of time and um, trying to slightly change the dynamic of the club that played for us as well as being into the club. Having such a strong second season, only three quarters of the way through again. Detailed by, by the COVID situation, and then obviously it went on points per game with 10 games left to go in that season where we should really be in an automatic promotion picture, going to the playoff campaign in front of nobody, get beaten at, at Wembley. And then in the midst of that, that pandemic, I had to just totally cut the squad. Um, I think we made three signs that off season. Uh, one was Roman Carvel, and the other was Jake Priest, and we signed Lewis Page late on in pre season. And we made a real effort and we made sacrifices to go with young players that season. But that sacrifice certainly paid off last season to see that group of the homegrown talent who had done it, years' experience with the belt. And probably the best experience they got was playing under no pressure and playing in the empty stage. You guys got to see it. It was brutal football to watch and to witness, uh, but a fantastic uh, experience for those young players to start learning the game and fine tuning the game. So when that Bradford game came around and the start of the season came around, they had between 30 and 50 games from the belt and they've gone from strength to strength. And then we've got to try and keep that identity no matter what we do this season in terms of our recruitment. We don't need to recruit too many players, uh, but we've got to keep our, our foundation of the, the core of XSC identity. Uh, that's a certain type of player, a certain type of person, first and foremost, um, and keep building up there. So later on, we'll be hearing from one of those in Archie Collins. I mean, how for you, how proud are you of those players like Archie, Josh, Jack Sparks, all those coming through the academy and making a mark on the first team? Yeah, I suppose it's as close as you can to a, a parental field. Um, we knew Archie as an great team. We knew his brothers within the academy at a young age group, and then to see him develop from the under 18 into the, the 20 years group, which I was running at the time, and um, see him go out on loan and see him get close to the first team and then get his first team opportunity, and then to find a, a niche in the market, find a position in that football pitch. And actually, I thought he was going from strength to strength. But of all the players we have within the group, if Archie Collins doesn't play, we miss him the most um, in terms of the style of football we want to play. And that's no disrespect to everyone else that we've got at the football club. He plays such a big role in terms of the middle of the pitch and the, the line and the, the actual control that he gives the team. So um, we're looking forward to what he can produce in League One this season. Um, one of the big aspects of promotion last season is he's seen if those young players and, and the rest of the group can produce a, a lower level of performance at the level. Um, and it is certainly a level. It's, a, it's going to be a certain standard of football, but there's no reason why they can't go and race it. And if they have success at League One level, then it's possibly a championship and they can be given rewards to go. It's hard to believe it's just over two months since we were all celebrating that promotion. I mean, we pre season has come. Lincoln coming on. Lincoln coming on. Lincoln on Saturday, so you just been twiddling your thumbs, you know, not thinking about <laughs> anything. Yeah, I mean, it was strange for the first time, uh, myself, my staff, that group of players, even before my time as managing Paul Tisdale's time, we got to play our finals. It was a COVID situation. We never really had that six, seven week block of absolute downtime. Now, there's never such a thing in football as, as a manager's downtime. We're still recruiting at all the trade pieces and pieces, and players have to get back to some sort of fitness. But they young players nowadays, anyway, they don't go out for six weeks and three months they need. Constantly, they don't put on weight, and uh, probably half of this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's not watching. Oh, is it online? Yeah. yeah you cut that one back. Um, yeah. Most of the group come back in pretty good shape. Um, so the, the, the young footballers are professional. Probably after two, two or three weeks, they were probably putting the thumbs. And um, we did a few sessions, a few open sessions, which are optional. And we probably had a couple of figures in terms of numbers, which is incredible. So, yeah, but it just shows what, what young players are about and young professionals are about nowadays. And then come back in pretty good spirits. Um, we try to work as hard as we possibly can. We have the early journey and then trip to the Vail, which is incredible. So these are big guys saw some of the footage from that facility. Uh, and you said it's on Gareth Bell, I believe. Yeah, well, one of the days we turned up and um, there's a guy playing on the pitch. Obviously, when we got closer, we figured out he was going to fail. Um, but he was there with two of his, he described them as business associates. One of them was in a full round of the so you can imagine one of the world's best players. His mate, who wasn't an athlete, but I mean, he's got a full round of drink kit. And another one, I think, a Northern North Irish lad, and another kit, um, just doing some sort of ball builds. Um, we paid a lot of money for the bell, so I sort of went across and said, Look, we obviously need the pitch. We're doing a 12 minute run to start with, so we're going around the offside. So, you know, please be respectful of the police. And uh, I didn't know quite how well he took it. Um, but just to see him, the way he moved, um, he only did two or three sprints, but the actual power within his body, and he's probably. Top side of 30 now in terms of his playing career, 
a real inspiration for the rest of the players. And we had a few jokes in terms of joining in as well when they were on the source of both, but he was due to fly out to America because I think he's joining, was it? Hello, yeah. 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 one of the American teams. Um, I mean, he said specifically he's doing that with a view for the, the next international tournament for Wales, where he can almost take his training and build it up for when he needs to for the, for the Welsh team. And obviously, the thing that in relation to that, but um, just to see where Cardiff and Wales get to train, um, hopefully, inspired from that group because I touched upon it before. Some of these players need some aspirations of success at the next level they're going into, but even beyond that, and the facility is there at Crystal City the other day. And, 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 and how would you say pre-season has gone? I mean, obviously it's not all about the results. And you said you said in the past yourself that we play these local teams to give something back to them because they often take our players on loan and help with their development. So it's important that we do things for yeah, them as well. We always find the balance of non-league opposition where we keep those relationships and keep the relationship within the, the community in the local area and the local possibilities for our, our young players. Um, and then we play the, the, the better teams of Bristol cities of the world. And that was the best game in terms of how clean the game was and what a showcase it was. But then the part of the body, so we played Yodel and Toki. Um, I was disappointed with the Yodel performance, I was a bit disappointed on, on Saturday, to be honest with you. But the, the players have got to understand that it's all about next weekend and what they can achieve in relation to the first points on offer when we go to link. But some players are in a position where they're going into the unknown, and sometimes the unknown can scare people. Um, I've got to settle them down as best I possibly can. Get them to understand their capabilities, get them to play to their capabilities, and they've got a really intact option for them and we can go with it with confidence. Um, the, the level, find out all the answers we need to know, and uh, relatively quickly as well. Um, so the players have got to go in with uh, an open mind and not too much, put too much stress on themselves. Then they've earned the opportunity to go play at the level, and um, hopefully that's, that's not too much for them. Um, some will do fairly well, some will struggle naturally. We'll try and get the balance right and play for a certain personnel, um, but we're certainly looking forward to this weekend. So first season in League One coming up this weekend. Um, how do you prepare for the jump up as well with the majority of the same squad? I know you've got players who've got experience in League One, like Tim and Giovanni and people like that. But how how do you prepare the young players for League One? That's one thing I'm conscious of. Um, Giovanni actually hasn't played League One football. Um, he was part of the Peter squad uh, as a young player, but he didn't play League One football. Tim Yang probably had a, a couple of difficult experiences with League One football, whether it's a relegation with South and possibly Bradford as well, I'm not too sure in relation to that. Sam Stubbs had a, a bit of time at Fleetwood, so by Jonathan Grounds, who played at a higher level um, within the squad, apart from the signing today, not many players have played at a level, so there's, a, there's that unknown factor. Um, so we just not built, um, not changed too much from last season, try to build a few extra blocks. We might have to tweak a few systems and structures some of our principles of play because we can't kick the ball away to the opposition so often we've got to retain possession. Um, but we've got to attack. We have to attack. We can't just rely on defence, which we did for the large parts last season. We spoke about those, those fine margins in relation to results. Um, opposition teams have more quality and, and they'll score more goals than teams did against last season. I do still expect us to be defensively strong, but somehow we've got to find a way to get the opposition, opposition that opportunity. I guess you have to be looking forward to coming up against like the Derby, Sheffield Wednesday, you know, to test test yourself and the players. Yeah, well, it's, it's a test. Um, test starts on Saturday. We, we can look really fine then in terms of the, 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 the local derbies, the big games, of the yeah, you know, the, the Boxing Day ones, which I think everyone's looking forward to, the Christmas period, the, the big names of historic English football clubs, Sheffield Wednesday, Derby, um, Portsmouth, Saturday, Saturday. Um, and we'll learn a little bit more about Saturday and um, we'll learn a little bit more about their group, a little bit more about the level. Um, they've got a new manager, new expectation at, at Lincoln. So the pressure's on them, there's no pressure on my group of players. I want them to enjoy the experience, even if we get beat on Saturday, I'm going to find a way where they can enjoy it. They did something last season where their will and design was second to none. It was one of our strongest points. Um, if we're feeling on down Finland, they kept on going to the same capacity which we were asking for and they were capable of, I'll be certain it's going to the same again this season. We can't not mention those Devon derbies as well. I think everyone's probably marked them in their calendar, but I mean, the last one went okay, didn't it? So, say that again, a couple of those. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it feels so long ago. Right? Just, and, and that was part of that COVID hit season where we had a, a second Devon derby to four. I think it was billed as a, the big game on the Monday night. Yeah, against four, so on so forth. Close together to the league, everything to play for. Close together to seven points. That opportunity was taken away from us. So, we're certainly looking forward to that. We hope that will behave themselves as well as they possibly can. I hope good spectacles of football for the Southwest. Um, anyone who's been down to see Plymouth play recently knows that how buzzing that stadium is and their, their fans are getting behind. We've been exactly the same on the back of the momentum of the promotion as well. There'll be big games of football, um, but first and foremost, there's some games to get on the ground before that. Hopefully, we go into those, which is in a good position. Um, 
Um, you mentioned it earlier, but just outside of that, obviously, we've got big redevelopment work going on at the training ground, you know, about time. I guess is what you're saying right now, but you know it's coming along, isn't it? It's a bit of a weird development as well because obviously they build the foundations and then they bring in the buildings in blocks. Don't yeah. Know, like, so yeah. But like it's from IKEA, maybe. <laughs> That's true. So there'll be this now and then a big gap, and then all of a sudden it'll appear later in, in the year, won't it? Yeah. From I'll build a better I wish I was. Give him a hand. Um, but by all accounts, they're doing the foundation at the moment. The concrete was going in in a big holes in the ground today. Um, and then these, only we could describe the glorified port cabins come in, which you get built, I think, in the north of England, and get brought down, get trained across and over our training, probably training building, and put together, um, and then almost put together as building blocks like you spoke about, in terms of Lego, um, and kitted out with what our training ground needs in terms of the provisions we can provide for the players. It'll take that provision to another level. Um, but we've waited a long time, we've not rushed it, and we've waited for the clubs to be financially stable in relation to, to achieving this. Um, and it's something that will take that, that training facility to the best it possibly can be. But that will be served as well, as with everything that exists in it, somehow the, the volunteers and everyone who's, who's helped us with that building have played a massive part in keeping that old building going. Somehow it's almost stuck together with, I don't know what, the glue, but sticky tape, it's still falling apart. Sometimes it leaks um, in the hot weather, it gets incredibly hot, but we still make it work. Um, and if we can make that work, we can certainly make the next building work. Uh, we're really looking forward to the extra conditions, maybe the, the food, lunch and the social aspect, when parents come to the academy in the evening somewhere to host people, and um, some of our official meetings, and um, everything to look forward to. We've got another sign that comes moving in the, the right direction. I think we forget that that's where the players spend, you know, 90 plus percent of their time, isn't it? So it's important for them to be comfortable somewhere and have that good facility. I mean, I guess it's going to help you when you bring players down and show them around. You're not embarrassed to show them this kind of building. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was my uh, one of my first signings. I'll never forget it. Um, it was Aaron Martin. I was showing him around the training ground, and I hadn't quite checked the, one of the corridors. And as I was taking down the corridor, it was a big, huge puddle that would leak overnight. The pictures were fantastic. It was cool at the time. Now, Charles, the pictures speak for themselves. And obviously, on the investment of the astroturf and the grass pitch is getting better and better and better. Um, we'll get to the stage where we've got a natural watering system similar to what we've got at the park, and that will take us to another level in relation to pitches. But in terms of the level we're playing at, the pitches are and that building is, is the next thing to come and it makes, means we've got a bigger car park as well a bigger size gym provision you know when you speak about them spending time on their feet actually training they spend a lot of time in the gym in the canteen within each other's remit in the change rooms and uh, video analysis many provision but not only for ourselves but in the bigger pictures the academy the production of players we should come in through you mentioned pitches there. I guess we should give Chaz a bit of a shout out. Is he here? He's not here. No, he's not here. I believe there's going to be an evening with Chaz too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he's he's the true star of the show. He is. Yeah. He gets more air time than you, I think. Rightly so. He picks the team. Comes in on a Friday. <laughs> if we're away on a, a Saturday, he me up and says, pick him. <laughs> so, he, he's a real superstar. Pitch looking great. He trained on last week. Yeah, um, it's a couple of weeks away from where it needs to be. Um, it'll look absolutely outstanding um, when we play our first couple game against Bob um, But that was another investment from the football club, um, and it's a significant, significant investment at that. Um, fans, players, myself, we're, we're not sick of it, but it was a difficult surface for us to produce our best football. And our home form has always been strong. Teams don't like coming down here, but in terms of the way the pitch and the way we play, um, we're trying to entertain people as well, don't forget that. And our pitches play the part in relation to that. So they, they improved pitch to help our performance last season. And Chaz was obviously a big part to play. Not only Chaz, but there's so many people within the club, um, whether it be the board members or the staff or the volunteers, who can play with their role um, and make the club the special unit that is. And, and I suppose Chaz is, is a special personality within it and we'll be glad to have it. Absolutely. Um, Moving on to recruitment, I mean, you know, finally signed some players today. Well, I had to get through it because I had to get shot. Most of the questions. <laughs> right? We're going to have to finish early, I think. I, I had to do it by the spot. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, um, we had to be patient, um, certainly in terms of the goalkeeping position. Um, we, were, we were really strong in our mindset that we wanted to wait for something we felt would help the team. And that's no disrespect to a lot of young, long goalkeepers who were probably available. Um, we needed to add a presence. You saw him today, so he's, a big friend, he? <laughs> he's a big boy, so physically he's a presence, um, character wise. Um, he's got the experience, he's had the exposure to different levels of football and um, training with the top level at Chelsea for a long time, but going out and playing championship level, going out and playing abroad um, out in America at the time in Europe as well. So, you know, but you put all that together 
and the age at the timing and the availability, and we feel it's a good signing in relation to what we were looking for. Yeah, like I said on the, the, the tape today in the video, he has got a slight legal in relation to his ankle, so don't be surprised if he's not involved this weekend. And we brought him in to play the majority of the league games. If that means missing one and playing 45 of the next games, uh, we believe that's going to be a really good sign. And for us, I mean, it feels like quite a big signing as well, of someone of his calibre and stature to attract down to Devon as well. Yeah, we had to push the boundaries to, to get um, financially, we had to push the boundaries. Um, that's probably reflected in a one year contract. Um, we, we've all got to be honest with each other. If he has a good season, then we're we'll going back to the championship, but he won't be going back to the championship, which he's done in recent times uh, to set up the bench. We're going to the championship to play. Is that calibre of goalkeeper? But we have to get him fully fit. Firing and playing well. Um, if we do that, we've got a hell of a keeper on our hands. Um, so the club, you know, we're grateful to the club to allow us uh, to be able to bring it down. Grateful to the agent, grateful to the player to allow that to happen to, to get going and to also to buy into what we're trying to do. It probably helped that he knew Scott Brown as well. His, his season at Wickham, I think I was like five or six years ago, if not more, um, one of his breakthrough seasons where he played the most amount of football he's actually played for our season. I think it was when Scott Brown broke his leg, possibly first or second game. Um, and Jamal came in and played with Jock that season, a successful season at Wickham at a young age. Um, but when Scotty came back from that injury, as a more senior goalkeeper, he played a really big part in his development. And they've got that relationship already. You always need a little bit of an in when you're trying to sign a player, certainly when in difficult circumstances. And I suppose that was the art in with Jamal. Um, and we have to work that and utilise it and get down. And uh, Kex, formerly known as Andy Trialist. Was it called, it? Was it? That's what he was called uh, in the Truro game, anyway. I mean, you, you cheeky said that he wasn't going to sign us, but most likely said he wasn't even on trial. And no, it, it, him today. It, it was an open option. Um, it became a realistic option when we put in an offer to Southampton, um, which uh, it was a law offer, uh, not in relation to Kex, but in relation to Southampton. But we knew that we wanted to strengthen other positions first and foremost. And the fact that they accepted that suggested that they're best for him to come to us and develop his game. You know, I expect him to be first team ready or first team part and start with in terms of a, a selection where he's going to start every single game. But in terms of a squad depth, certainly at the moment with, with the pressure on Andre Kai to Groyds and Tim Diang on the back of last season, a few needles, there's a piece of Mark to come from Mark Levy later on. We need an extra body in place that we feel even more so going to play a midfield three as opposed to a two and a one, which we did last season. Um, so we were open to that if it was a right deal for football. Plus, he did a question in those two weeks, not on his goal, but he performed relatively well in the Oval game. But he pressed more with his character and his personality. If you've got a young player who wants to improve, which he certainly does, and we've got a good player on hands at some stage. He seemed like a really switched on character when we spoke to him earlier today as well, really eager to play and impress as well. Yeah, hopefully he stays like that throughout the course of the season. And testament to his, his family and Southampton in relation to his football, upbringing, in his home life. He's got really good qualities. And like I say, he's got a good physical attribute for a young kid. You know, he'll probably be at his best in two, three, possibly four years' time, possibly in Premier League. And finally, before we take some questions, they're um, <coughs> about to become a father as well. Um, probably due when we're going to play. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, excited about that. I mean, what's going to happen if, it's, if it happens before the game or before Saturday? Well, Charles. Charles will be there um, with Wayne on and Dangry. Look, it will get to a point where the phone will be readily available, possibly with a video on the bench or someone in the stand. Life is what it is. And you want to be there for your first one, let alone any children that come along the way. So it's going to be a big moment for myself and my wife and the family in the next few weeks. And touch good, it all goes well. And touch good, the football's not taking too much stress and pressure away from what's most important in life. And really looking forward to it. And it's not just me, and MJ's got a kid on the way this week as well. Exactly. Will there be a crash out of the training ground? Or? Well, we're trying to get a question. <laughs> so, possibly one year for match day, and then you never know the trend. Right? Brilliant. Right, I think we'll <coughs> take some questions if anyone's got any. I'm sure Craig will pass the mic around. That's all I'm good for. <coughs> Matt, Saturday's game with uh, our player basically saying something racist, which I don't believe. Um, what's the update on that one? I know you can't really go in into yeah. I don't believe any of it really. No. Um, see things where um, anything on that's not right, we'll go to an investigation panel and I think they'll decide whether or not he gets investigated first and foremost. I know or I believe what our player said, and I believe it's not racist as well. And it was a, a misheard comment from the opposition player. And the opposition 
player, if he caught us, what he did, he did the right thing in terms of reporting to the referee. Um, the referee obviously then reported because it was a strange moment because no one really knew what was going on. Uh, myself, the captain and the player in question, were called to the referee's room after the game. Um, we relayed all the information we had, the referee relayed the information he had, and then he reports it to the FA. And we're in the process of our secretary finding out what the timeline is in relation to what that looks like. But I fully support the player. I, I believe what he said wasn't racist in any way whatsoever. And how is he taking it personally? How is he affecting it? Yeah, it's affecting him. It's not nice to be accused of something you've not done. Um, it's what it's like any crowd. Um, if you've not done it, then it's not nice to be accused of it. Um, something we don't want to be associated with in any way. So it's not a, hopefully uh, an unfortunate incident that gets resolved pretty quickly. Um, but we've all uh, media. I'm not going to talk about that, that topic at the moment. Um, it has to be investigated right here. Hi, man. Um, I'm a football supporter of Exeter fan that lives in Mexico. <laughs> I've had a discussion. <laughs> I just wonder, in terms of their player recruitment, do Exeter ever consider looking for players in other parts of the world, such as Mexico? And what would be the restrictions that would affect any potential signing because there are a lot of great players that are in that part of the world. Yeah, um, I'm sure there are players in Mexico. Um, first and foremost, we've got to be able to see if the witness of recruitment as hard as it possibly can be in England, let alone in Mexico. We've got to go to Wales, to Scotland, to Ireland, possibly to, to the European areas in academy teams as well. So not only the non league system, so we've not got a load of bodies in relation to staff, we can't afford to have that, so we've got to fine tune it in terms of what we can identify and where we can identify it. Um, but also in terms of, I think I'm right saying, in terms of foreign players coming to the UK, they have to be at an international level to get a work permit. I think I'm right in saying that. Um, so if they're Mexican international, they might not come to Texas City as much as we'd like them to, um, but maybe if they're played at a youth level, that might allow to happen with that, that work permit. Um, the truth of the matter is, I don't know much about Mexican football, but Henry Cooper probably doesn't. Um, I've not got the staffing manpower to be able to understand it in relation to what would be needed to, to recruit effectively and to bring in the type of profile we, we really need. Yeah, there have been one or two British players that play that, like uh, Robert Wolf Morrison, who's played in Mexico recent times. He's played everywhere. Yeah, I think so. The kind of players in Derby, got his name. Anyway, there are one or two that have played, yeah. and they're not internationals, to my knowledge, but, they, um, yeah, I mean, there's such a, a vast number of good players there, but very few seem to come over from yeah. touch upon the reasons, I guess. Yeah, that could be exactly that, um, but not only XCC, how many clubs have got the finances to go on and recruit to scout out in Mexico, unfortunately. So it's, it's one of those things where we would be quite strong with our mindset of where we're looking to recruit from, but also, first things first, what's inside the building, what's going through the academy, what's the, the pathway for our, our young players, and then we try to always add on top of that in terms of Mexico or any other country to do. We're always open to, to fresh ideas and to fresh players coming to the club. They've got to be right with the football club. And we have to be realistic in terms of what we are, in terms of XSC. I mean, Nick's sat the front and I'm sure we've been asking for a free season trip out to Mexico next time around. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to scout some players out. Thank you. You going for a peek? No. No? Are you just getting a mic, Ben? You can ask a question, man. I can ask a question. I asked Matt. Last year, about the quality of uh, match play officials in League Two. I'm just hoping, are you hoping for a better League One? Well, I hope for improved performance. I, I think I'm right in saying it's people from the same group. Um, if they're League One and League Two, they're from the same specific group in relation to match play officials. Um, I think there's been a couple drop out of the EFL um, match day official group. Um, Possible he's one of those. I think I'm right to say. Um, but he's, he, he's just one of a, a number of officials who've, who've probably been identified as struggling, and that's probably happened for the first time in terms of the referees committee. So they've identified the ones who've struggled, they've promoted certainty. We always hope for better performance in relation to that. It's one of the thing, few things which, as manager, I can't control. Um, it probably frustrates you guys as much as it does myself. Um, I didn't feel we were on the, the wrong end of too many big decisions last season. 
which is always the market price in the past few hours when things go against us. Okay. Just a quick question, Matt. Um, thanks for speaking to us tonight. I speak to you so busy. Um, really pleased to hear the silence today. Um, but being a football fan, as you know, by breakfast time tomorrow morning, someone's going to ask, so I'll ask it now. Striker? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we hope to have one, possibly two strikers in before the end of the window. Um, one might be alone when that is, it depends on the parent, but that's one thing I have to be so respectful of. Um, if we're in the long market, which we are, we can't talk freely about who these players are and where they're coming from. And they're still training and playing for other clubs at a high level for themselves. So we're trying to keep those relationships where they need to be. Um, but we do expect to be a that one, possibly two players will come into the group in terms of that position. There's other positions we're looking to strengthen as well. And the most powerful ones we got in the door today. Um, and then we look to build and build on top of that. Brilliant. But they're the hardest ones to find as well. So I'm the most expensive. One of the things that seems to be a trend at the moment is increasing the role of agents in deciding what goes on. Is that a problem to you or is it an opportunity? <laughs> um, how long have you got? Oh, we've got to be <laughs> Agents are what agents are. They're in the game, we can't stop them. We try and build relationships. We try and build a relationship with parents and families and players first and foremost, and then the agents on top of that. Um, but when it talks, um, and unfortunately, if uh, Asian feels he can get more money out of the deal elsewhere, he'll push that deal through. So it's as simple as that in relation to the way Asians work. So I'm always as honest as I can when I feed some fact to you guys. Obviously, I spoke about that with one situation at the weekend. It doesn't look like it's going to resolve itself, and the Asian has played a significant part in that. And for such a good player, it's really interesting that there's only a market at the moment north of the border. Um, and that's only simply down to the fact that if he's out of contract at the end of this season, which he is, it will go to a tribunal and a compensation package. Now, not for the board of Scotland, but then everywhere apart from England, pay a lot less than what English clubs do. And um, so that suits their current situation. So, not ideal for ourselves, but it's, it's in the game. It's like the officials, there's certain things you can control, certain things you can't control. Um, and unfortunately for ourselves, the biggest problem we've got as a football club is these ages get into the young players before they even get close to the first team. And not only before they get close to the first team, before they're adults and before they're able to make their own decisions. And they are even easily influenced. And we talk about some support network for any young player, parents first and foremost. And then realistically, it's, it's agents on top of that. And if they're getting advised in a poor way, then we're talking about finances first and foremost, as opposed to the game first and then substance to the game first. And then the finances and the rewards will come. Young players get their heads turned. And we can't compete with the finances elsewhere at the academy level. Or at a young trans transitional stage, um, where it is what it is in terms of the game. It's, it's tangential to that, really. You know, it's about playing passports. Um, are, they, are they fluid, or, or, or does it like a player who understand what the pathway is like a year or so ahead, or something like that? Yeah, we've got a, a, a detailed pathway for each and every player. It has to be flexible because football's constantly moving, it's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing. Injuries happen, form happens, players go to a level where they struggle to take a little bit longer to progress. Um, all we can do is to bridge that gap and speak about the player pathway so it's more for, for young players at a football club. Um, the academy gives them a fantastic foundation, um, but it's the hardest to bridge the gap from the academy level to the first team transitional phase they call it and um, from basically from an 18 year old to 21 22 23 years of age which is why the law system has worked so well for ourselves in the past but we really believe in it because it it toughens them up bit hard but it puts them out there out, out of their comfort zone puts them into the, the, the men's football world where three points is at stake managers jobs at stake some players are getting paid they go on coach journeys players can look themselves in different ways we want them to play at the highest level of law so it's close to to our level of football, um, and sometimes they build and build and build. But there's not many young players I can think of who are now in our first team or come into our first team and left the club or played in our first team who didn't have an original long spell and um, which benefited them in a certain way. Um, and those pathways are detailed and discussed with the player, discussed with the parent, discussed with the agent. Um, but obviously, things get pulled here and then at rare times. And sometimes at the end, for them, we look differently to what we want the end to look like. We want the end to look like a first team player. Who plays a certain amount of games for ourselves, represents the club really well, does well for the football club, Ollie Watkins, example, Joe Rell, example, and then goes and moves for 
to a substantial transfer fee and goes to the level when they go as first team players because they've earned the right to go as a first team player. If you have success with our first team, then you move on as a first team player, as opposed to what we, the example we just spoke about, where players are going to go to another academy product, another academy level. There's no better place to be a young football than NXSC. Believe me when I say that. And a lot of young players, the case is an example. There's a reason Southampton want to send the case um, to ourselves for the, the loan deal that it is, because um, we, we feel we can develop them. They feel we can develop them. They'll feel we've given them a clear halfway in terms of what will happen with him this season. That's a Premier League club at a top, top level, sending a player for, to us for a reason. And hopefully our young players see that and see the sign because sometimes you can get caught up in the excess city bubble and you don't quite know what happens elsewhere. And some players go too soon, some players go and then you don't see their names on a team sheet for an awful long time. And then they're available to us for long or they want to come back to us. And so you see it all different ways, but you also see the ones who go on in the best possible positions. The ones who've gone with a certain amount of games on their belt, a certain amount of experience, a certain amount of know how in terms of their game, and they go on to produce fantastic um, performances elsewhere. Ollie Watkins is a prime example in relation to that. Great. Thank you. Can I just ask one If you make it quick, that's fine. How do you deal with it as a club? You said that they, the team are a close net, and if this has been turned, how does the club deal with that sort of thing now? We can support him. That's all we can do. We can support him. We can control him in the pathway. Um, but ultimately, as manager, players have to play football. Um, so whether that's if he's not quite ready for the first team, which realistically we check in some stubs ahead of him, he probably isn't quite ready for that. So where is he going to play football? He's going to be out of luck for, for whatever reason that club move isn't happening at the moment. It might happen in the future. Players have to keep playing. The moment they stop playing football, then we're paying wages for no reason. Yeah, but then, then we understand that the situation in terms of the bigger picture and, and also the investment we put into all, not just him, but all our young players for a long period of time. And we don't need a, a financial reward all the time, but we need to see a play investment at times. But we also need to see a bit of investment that is something that appreciates what's been done at a football club. Um, and that's when you're looking for those relationships to stay strong. And that's just one example, which it happens time and time again. I want to say that, for example, which is out at the moment because now it's my job to find a solution to it. We try to do it privately, we've got to do it publicly now. We need to even need him to get it played or his market to improve. From a selfish point of view, we need to get something out of this deal. So we need that to change one way or another in the next few weeks. Otherwise, we have a player who's not playing football. We're still developing, but he's not getting games. I mean, he needs to develop them. Can I just ask a very quick supplementary to that? How about the loans to, uh, to National League teams? Is there a problem in terms of training? No, no. We've got National League offers for some of our young players, and they'll go there. Uh, Seymour and I uh, went to York last season. We're being comfortable with when they go out and bump and train at those clubs those because they post the National League clubs off the time. So there's no problem whatsoever in relation to that. We've been crying out for a lot of National League clubs. We saw a place Chris Harvey just got into. To your own because he knows it, he's safe. he knows his staff really well, he knows the players well, he wants to take our players on along. For whatever reason, he thought he had never wanted to do that. He did it for a small people, Jack Sparks. When he came back, Jack Sparks he said that was a more senior young player, so to speak, I'm saying, I mean, so we used each other in relation to that. Um, once it location wise and geography wise, we've not got a whole host of post national league clubs and to, to send these young players out on to, um, because that's the level which is closest to, to football league. Obviously, it's closer to League Two than League One, but it's a fantastic level of football. And if, if you're a young player who can play National League Premier League football, you'll have a fantastic stepping stone towards next. We better be on that before we run out of time. Um, thank you for questions, but now I guess we better get Craig Archie and Sam. Are they going to talk? 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 Oh, any more questions then? Just wondering what your views are about having five substitutes this season instead of three. Um, look, uh, <laughs> last season I think it would have helped us because we had a strong squad in relation to the league we were in. It would be a bit of a hindrance this season. You've only got to look at the squads um, and some of the fans the back of some of the teams towards what we think will be the top end of the table. Um, and their benches are very <laughs> strict. <laughs> so then we have to change the outcome of the game's place for that. But as a manager, you certainly give you more options. Apart from the FA Cup debacle, where you won too many FA Cup games, we use the substitutes quite well. Um, it's strange, it's something that I've done on the be able to change half the graphical theme. Um, 
Nanti kita susah atau kita sulit sih pokok. Absen kalau memang kau tay dengan apa sahaja yang kita buat kita posit besar. Less the focus or less the impact on the fitness of players. We we pride ourselves enough to get our group up, and they were certainly fit to us. We expect to be fit for the league one this season, and, and they do all hard work for the season and throughout the season for a reason. Be able to play for ninety plus minutes. We're going down the group of group, but in very probably of impact players. You might have watched England's international recently, and international rugby now they have prop two a bit, bit bigger than the starting prop two come on for the last twenty minutes. We're going to get that sort of aspect in, in professional football as well. So I'm not for it, um, not just for the reasons I've stated for relation to this season, but I think you've got to be strong in terms of using your squad and looking out to use resources. I mean, how long have we been to constitute 60s, 70s, possibly two substitutes at most in the 80s? And all of a sudden we go to three and five. Um, it's a few modern day trend, but I can guarantee it's because the top Premier League manager is all about the workload, which is exactly right. Believe me, the international footballers and the Premier League footballers get the workload too much and they're never fresh. But then that's down to the leagues to realise that they should allow the players to be fresh by playing those games. And it reverts back to the league. Can we make a play by football game? But also, it's a vicious cycle, um, which is ultimately covered by the top top level. I think they're ready now after their break. Um, if we can welcome Sam Stubbs. Such and Thank you very much for joining us. I think it's been a bit around the museum, which is good. I think all the fans of all the programs have been in. Reminiscing about some games he scored in, so probably one or two. Um, <laughs> I guess we start with uh, both of you, really. Um, more so to say, in your first season, you get the promotion to Leicester City, and after obviously you've been here for years now, it must have been a really proud moment for both of you. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think I think it was obviously one of the at the start. I was 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 tough. Um, so yeah, I, I think just as soon as we got got past that that type of phase and, and then we got to the football, it was easier um, for myself. And it was clear it was it was good. The fact that I think when we come into the team, I think we had the toughest assembly with, with injuries and COVID, but the team was good and the team was um, was waiting to kick on. I felt like that. I, think I was just lucky um, when it did come in. That uh, we were good and the, and the team started to play well. So it was a good time to come in, and obviously the end result was was, was good. Oh, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the start of the season, we were um, doing three hours together, weren't we? Yeah. So we were both injured. And um, obviously, stuff goes on for a lot longer, didn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> nah, and obviously, it was just excited to get back on the swing of things. And obviously, the boys put us in a good position and we kicked on to that, really. And we went from strength to strength. And maybe at the time, we didn't. Enjoy it as much as like a season when you look back and really on what you actually achieved. Um, because every game is a must win of three points, there's a lot of pressure. But looking back, and yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, I really, really enjoyed that season. Sam, you had a quite difficult start for us this year, degree. You couldn't seem to shift for the injury, and I think when you got COVID in your first week down here as well. Um, <laughs> And go to tag you, apparently, yeah. So, um, <laughs> but you, you made your debut in the January of, of this year and um, made your mark quite quickly, and then Matt couldn't shift you out of the team, could he? You just kept on performing. You must be really pleased with your personal performances in the second half of last year. Uh, yeah, like obviously, obviously, uh, it's, it wasn't probably as easy as what you said. It was, it was a few games leading up to that, and then a few. So so not great performances. Um, so yeah, it wasn't wasn't an even even I don't think I was I would have made it. I probably wanted to be. I think it was still games where I thought I could have done better and whatever. But um, you know, I'll just say because yeah, but the whole process the gap has been brilliant. That's all the staff have been brilliant in terms of the back end and the need to just. To go out and play, obviously that time time out, it's not easy to do that. Um, so my plans a little to the boys day to day, so just find ways to try to get to, to get me to a level because obviously 
last year we had Sweden's, we had Czech, we had done very well, we had Al, we had Brownsy, um, George, George Ray at the time, so it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't as easy as, I say as a leader, but it wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing, so I think all credit to everyone involved in terms of getting me back on the pitch that, that I um, could repay the faith a little bit. You mentioned your training schedule is a bit different day to day. Um, often, you might have training videos on social media and people yeah. think, yeah, where's Stubbsy? Where's Stubbsy? I think you mentioned a little bit about your schedule. That often, you do do individual work. Yeah, it's uh, just with, with, with the Indians, it's more so the manage, management type of thing. Um, I think, obviously, at the time, oh, it's not sort of the greatest of injuries to have, but I think we, we do brilliant in terms of day to day management of it. Um, and I think we, last year we got into a good flow of doing exactly what I needed in terms of getting me, getting me in a position where I was right to, to go because it's not easy. Because um, it, it's got a mind of its own when it, when it wants to. Um, but this pre-season, I feel like I'm coming to a little bit or better pair. I think the, the start, I was struggling with probably a little bit of fitness. Um, but I feel day by day, I, I'm getting a little bit closer to where I need to be, I think. After you all move on, I've got a question for you. Um, Matt was speaking earlier about pre-season scheduling, how sometimes it's not important about the results. It's about, in the early days, give it to most of the helping out local sides that you've been on loan to before and sent other players on loan to as well. Um, how do you think pre-season has gone for you? Um, I mean, I had a good break. You um, <laughs> <laughs> went to Bali. <laughs> yeah, I went to Bali for a bit. Um, um, overall, I feel like yeah, it's going really well. Um, obviously, like you said, the results don't matter as much, but it's obviously ideal if you win those games or any game really. Um, but the main thing is obviously getting into the right shape for Saturday and getting in. Um, like yeah, like minutes on the about physical, mentally ready for the season. And has it been nice coming back into the training ground and not seeing too many new faces? Obviously, you retained quite a lot of the team ground last season. Um, so there's not loads of new names to learn, and, and you've got that that core unit still there. Yeah, of course. I mean, every well, we've got a great change room. I think. Um, staff and all the best and yeah our changing room is like great to be a part of the lads are great um so yeah not many new faces maybe once in a day um but yeah no i mean we're, we're looking forward to this new challenge where our season we put ourselves in a great position and yeah we just got to be excited for us to come and enjoy it you mentioned the new signing today one of those you want it's almost like two signings or something <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Even I like frame my net. Um, and yeah, I think we're looking forward to that photo of him to the next round there, aren't we? Moving on to the wellness, Sam, that's the level you've played at for Archie to be a first for you. So there's two, two contrasting players there. Sam, you've played, played for Fleetwood. Um, have you ever said to him what they might expect from League One or yeah. him? No, not not really. No, um, I was I was brief. I think I had six games, and then I got the injury. I think I didn't play much of Fleetwood. Um, I think other other loans were probably experienced a level similar to it. <clears throat> um, so it's definitely definitely a level up, um, especially this year. If you look at the stuff of the team that that's in there. Um, but like Archie, I think I think we've still got the core of our team. So I think. We're in a good position for, for this year. I think uh, for me, I think we were the best team in, in League Two last year. I think obviously that, that last day of season they go to plan and, and, and whatnot. But I think we're in a, a good position to, to go and join League League One. It's definitely definitely a step up. I think you, you'll be punished a lot more, and I think you'll probably get less chances. I think that's that's what happens the higher you go up. But I think just as a team, as a club, we've got to embrace it and understand it's, it's probably going to be a challenge but it's why you worked so hard last year to, to, to give yourself the opportunity to, 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 to try and get in the team first and then to try and, to try and do well. It's probably a difficult question to answer what you expect from League One. Obviously you've got 
teams of size like Derby and, and Unifit, some of the names they brought in, and then the smaller teams with, with smaller budgets like Burton and Newark. It's just such a variety of teams in the third division this year. Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's, there's no loop into it either. I think you've, like I said, look at Aki's. I think Aki's think Rochdale when they were in the one, spoke to a boy that used to play there. I think they played on a park when they really could find it. So I think the, 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 there's a difference, but I think, there's, like I said, there's no blueprint. I think. Um, first and foremost for us it would be work hard and try and match them from that point of view and then um, and then yeah like, try, try and try and shine through with the quality but it's a challenge I think everyone at the club is, is looking forward to. Uh, on to RTRT, we spoke about Derby and Sheffield Wednesday there's some big big clubs in the league I imagine you're really looking forward to playing on that and what would be some pretty and atmosphere. Yeah I mean that's what we players want to be playing in front of big stadiums and fans and obviously the clubs like Derby, like you said, are the big, big clubs. I mean, yeah, I'm just excited. I'm sure more players are excited just to be out there and, yeah, like Stubby said, to see what challenge we'll be faced with and hopefully we'll come through it. And, yeah, we're in there for a reason. I mean, yeah, like Stubby said again, we worked so hard. Um, last season to put ourselves in this position, so you just got to go with it. And what do both of you think you learned about yourselves last season that you think you can apply? Put you on the top. Just let our team talk for a second. I think for me, my mind's a bit of a serious one. I think because I was out so long. I think mine was probably just to enjoy it. I think I was. I think I probably still don't do it fully. I think I, I was very serious with the injury, and even before I think was I probably didn't play to some great clubs, some great stadiums. I probably didn't take it in at the moment. I think I was probably right so as well. I was all serious and looking for results and stuff like that. But I think just probably give me a time to just take a step back and just appreciate my job and on what I get to do. And um, so yeah, I think I think that my main one just to so sometimes probably just slow down a little bit and just just understand what we're doing. I think like Archie said, you don't I think when you're in the moment of it last year and everything's a must win, you probably don't enjoy it as much as, as what you should. Um so I think probably just taking a step back at time to time and just probably realising what we've done and, and, and hopefully what we can do this year. Need more time Archie? Um, I'm not sure, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just to like, add on to stop the, like, football's always on to the next game. And I mean, it comes, it goes so quick when you're in and amongst it. And yeah, you've got to appreciate like, where this team and this club is. And <clears throat> Have good performances and good results, and stay on each other. Um, we are running close to time, and there is still to speak to Nick, so I've opened these to answer questions much more. Um, so I'd like to open up for questions. Um, anyone have any? One percent, really. One percent, really, because I I can't remember how much he had played it before. <laughs> Sam, what's your opinion of the moves to ban heading for the under 12s? Um, bearing in mind that most of the uh, injuries that the uh, older players have had uh, occurred when they were heading in a leather ball in the 50s and 60s, something like before. Uh, what, what's your view on the uh, present day situation? I think. I think there's probably, I think there's people probably in a better position with, with more understanding from a medical point of view, what what's good and what's not. But I think um, I can understand why why decisions being made. I think it's probably in a grand scheme of things a good decision maybe. But I think it's probably important that we find another way of, of trying to expose ways to it. I think it's something that I probably wasn't exposed to enough um, is head. And I think especially in, in the to the lower leagues, I think it's such an important part of the game. I think it's something I probably a little bit later. Um, so I think probably from a medical point of view, I think it's probably a good thing. I think 
even if it's a softer ball or, or something other, I think it's still important to expose players to it. Because I, I think if you don't do it at a young age like anything, I think you probably become a little bit short or not as good. And then probably the other thing is ah, he's actually right at Evan he's does a lot for us to be fair, so <laughs> Counteract it. So this that, that decision by the football league or by the FA. Um, because if you've not got a good team and technique in terms of heading, it'll actually damage your, your head more, damage your brain more, the hardest part of your head is your forehead. So in terms of young players of under 12s, they have to learn how to head the ball properly. So use a flyaway, use a scrub ball, don't take the heading that became at that age. Just use a softer ball. Um, so in terms of that, sometimes you have difficulties of if they don't understand or learn how to hit the ball properly, they'll damage themselves more by hitting the ball. Any more questions? Yeah. 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 I can comment a bit, sorry, I mean, a bit of was. Um, look at James Bill, the James Bill, the 36 years old, the fifth player by Captain Martin, their score. How does that fit in with more score? Who's the fitness on the fitness test of the season? Question. Um, Kite is up there. Yeah. Harry Kite. Uh, probably one of the biggest calves I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a machine, isn't he? Yeah, um, he eats the ground. So Harry Kite's the one. Uh, he's got incredibly strong legs. Uh, but obviously, he's had a bit of a, a groin problem in the last couple of weeks. Um, with relatively a fit group. Um, Joel Randall, before he went, was incredibly fit. He played when growing up. He, he always had that in his game. <laughs> Stops his fit, yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> last time. But then, like I said, they're not like the old school footballs, even back in my day, so five or six years ago. It, it takes us a few weeks to get up to that speed, but we don't really need to do too much fitness work. I think we've done a 12 minute run and possibly a four minute run. Nothing longer than that, and nothing further than that. So there's less distance needed. And um, they always have off season programs as well. So, um, gone are the days of them doing that first run and then being sick by the side of the pitch. But generally, a fit group, uh, and within that, there's some individuals who can probably take their game to a new level. Less fitness, and if Sam didn't have the, the need to stop the training as much, he'd be certainly be up there. And we still think there's more from, from Archie Collins as well. <laughs> Come on, Scotty, jump in. Yeah. <laughs> Not with the as well, is it? <laughs> your oh, okay. Great, right, go back. <laughs> Just to Any more questions? <laughs> Do players enjoy long trips, stay there, also when you look also get a car or other things? Do you do you find the long trips boring or a um, good way of kind of mentally getting yourself ready to go? I mean a lot of it. Certainly, in terms of we call it dead time, where you just sat on the couch on top of to do anything productive. Um, we had some difficult journeys with traffic and coaches breaking down and bits and pieces, fancy, which we can't do anything about it. It happens. Um, and maybe that helped our team spirit, uh, bring the group together. And the worst ones are on the way back to get beat, yeah. even more so if you don't like pizza or whatever, stand or two together. <laughs> They're pretty brutal, but you guys do the same. You do the same during time, just at different stages of. Anything, we're a little bit lucky that we go up on a, a Friday for the journey with a bit of training, but that's at Boston Bay, Bristol, or, or Birmingham. I think we're training at Solihull on Friday, with a race for the game. So we're able to break that journey and we're pulling a more luxury type coach then we able to support as well. Um, but the actual time and the amount of time you can put about the season, we famous went to Barrow to buy the um, season before last, so those games get pulled off. And mentally, it's the same as all the And physically, it can have an effect as well because they don't quite move in the same way they would do in a short gym. Probably not time for one more. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Who sorts out where you're training in? How your panels that take? Uh, your new pizza places? Your new food? Is that all done in house? By yeah, so the um, second school secretary, Andy Gillard, does most of it. Coach with me, Barry's coach with me. So they give us a travel time in terms of where we've got to go to, whether it's Google Maps or, or anything like that. Um, and then we decide where our best route is in relation to training. It was difficult, certainly during the pandemic, because a lot of the training grounds were closed off for other teams using them, and rightly so. Uh, so we, have, we weren't able to train at as many places. So hopefully more places are open up, and we've got enough relationships with these clubs to say, can we use the AstroSurf? We did very little on a Friday. So it's a very much a, a sort of match prep session. It should take no longer than 45 minutes to an hour, where we do some boxes to get them feeling good about themselves. And then we split with a defensive unit and sort of attacking unit, one in the pitch. Um, and then we bring it all together for a bit of shape and set pieces. So there's nothing physical on a Friday. Um, it's about freeing the players' minds up. You've done most of your work from basically Monday to Thursday. And then Friday, it's just a little bit of a reminder, a bit of a touch up, and also getting them mentally in the right place. But all those logistics come down to Dandy Gillard with a bit of a, an input from myself and from Mike Carlisle. I'm probably maybe on a verbiage as well, the SSC coach and California physio. Thanks so much for everyone's questions. Um, before we hand over to Nick, um, thanks to Matt, thanks to Sal and to Archie. I'm more than welcome to say this to me if you want, or head off the video to you. And uh, yeah, let these guys decide and then we'll work with Nick. <laughs> One little bit behind, so just to speak little things, uh, speak things up. The back of the already been drawn, so Nick has the honor of doing that as well as part of his, uh, his speech. So there's the winning numbers. You can do that at any point. That's already been done, then. So you've got the time, so you can cross check. <laughs> Um, yeah, like I said, you've got, uh, got 20 minutes. Um, so, there we go. so we'll, we'll, we'll do the tickets first. And if anybody, uh, it's a good time to go and come for a break, get us a drink if you want as well. The winning tickets, um, these are pink tickets. Number 30, 30, 68, 117. One three three one five four two two five and two three four. And if you've got a grey ticket, it's number two, number seventy six, one oh one, one two six, one seven two, one eight nine. Two six three and two nine eight. If you've got a winning number, just have some idea if you can pick up um, your, your, your prizes. I know we're. Wait, so the, these forums are. Um, I'm going to carry on talking. I know we've got such a little time. These forums are an obligation on the club. There are EFL regulations that say we have to have forums. I'm not sure if it's two or three a year. So um, it's great fun. It's lovely to see everybody. But we, we, we do have to see them, and it's important. Uh, that we do. So, just got a couple of, because shortness of time, I've just picked out a few um, highlights. Uh, to, following on the last forum that we've done, there, there's quite a debate about uh, the women's team and the funding of the women's team and actually having a, a ground to play at. So, I think you're all aware now that they've secured the, the ground at Exwick, which is, is, is great news. Um, and also, the club have increased the donation that we make towards the women's team, the contribution that we make. Uh, last season was £5,000. This season, we've increased that to £25,000.
A couple of weekends ago, I was speaking to um, the, uh, a person involved at, at the Crystal Palace women's team, and they're just two leagues above us, and the Crystal Palace contributed 300,000. So it gives you a sense of, as you go up the leagues, where, where we need to get to, whether it's, it's a big, big jump. Uh, but, but making progress uh, in, certainly in the right direction. Updates on, on the, the cliff hill that, that, that Matt was referring to. There's been a little bit of a delay on the um, foundations. We're, we're obviously using a, a different company now because the, the first one that we were using has gone into administration. Uh, and the pressure points on the design of the building uh, look exactly the same. The interior would be the same, but where the pressure on the, uh, on the design of the building falls was different from the original design. And so we've had to change the work where well concrete um, supports have placed. So it's a little bit of delay on, on the foundations, but that won't cause a delay on the delivery of the buildings. They've been, built, I think, somewhere in Halifax, I believe. The, 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 the difference between the, the, the first suppliers and the second one, the first suppliers were really keen to get into the sports uh, business. They mostly done uh, school buildings. And, and that re was reflected in the quote that they gave us. The, the, the guys that we're using now, Modulek, um, they're uh, ex experienced in sport. They've done a lot of Premier League teams, and that's reflected in their price, unfortunately. So we're having to find an additional £800,000 uh, to, to pay their bill. It, it's a, a real challenge, and, and that obviously will be reflected in our, our accounts next, this time next year. Um, and it will be necessary for the club to borrow £600,000 from the trust. And so all of you trust members in the room, thank you ever so much for your support. We're, we're doing these things because, because you're there and, and paying your subscriptions and, and helping the club out incredibly. Um, quick quick word on, on playing budget. I'm quite pleased Matt didn't, didn't mention it. He has got a slightly increased playing budget this year. We, we couldn't keep it at, at, at the same level as last year. Again, it's the trust that are, are providing the funding for that or guaranteeing the funding. Um, and just a 10% increase on what he had last season. I, I should probably try and put that in some context. Uh, so we, we are certainly have a playing budget that is comparable to teams like Cambridge, Cheltenham, um, I think one of the, the, the other side, I, I, um, Wimbledon are coming down now, haven't they? So Burton, Bert, some of the smaller sides, uh, if, if we start looking at bigger sides like Chong, uh, if it went down, we reliably important that Chong had a 10 million pound playing budget. We don't go anywhere near that. So it's, this season is, is a real challenge for us. And, um, and, and for Matt to put a, a good team on the pitch and compete, but also for the club board to, to build up that playing budget, which we, we know we need to do. We, we decided just before Christmas, that, and, and that this is when we didn't know whether we were going to get promoted or not, but the club board decided that it was important that we try to be a League One club, not just a League One team. And that's being reflected now in some of the sponsorship deals that we're entering into. You've probably seen the Selco um, the building warehouse signs outside, it's a big national company. John Lewis is sponsoring this room, again, another national company. So we really, the commercial team, is Carrie here? So Carrie's team are doing a fantastic job spreading the news of the work about Exit City uh, that, that we're really worthwhile club to come and come and support and won't always go the way we want to do things won't always look the way we want to do which is really important that we attract those big spenders um so uh, carrie and her team are doing a, a fantastic job and i'm sure we'll continue i've um, got several new it systems going in which is again a reflection of where we want to go to as a club so investing in technology and hr system and finance systems and I, I don't know if, if, you, can, if, wonder, if, you want, if you want to wonder about the corridor, you'll see that make quite a lot of changes in the uh, heritage suite. We made that a lot bigger so we can fit more people in. 
Um, but the director's box has changed quite a lot to make people more comfortable there. The directors will eat in the director's box this year. What that does is it frees up space in this lounge that we can actually sell. So lot, lot, lots of changes happening to generate more, more revenue for the club. And we do hope that the, the, the plan is that we will do some work on the downstairs or uh, we just need a few weeks to save up more pennies. I, want, I wanted to give you a, a, a sense of where we are in the, in the football pyramid, the amount of help that we get. And it, the, the, so you, the Premier League provide what's called solidarity payments to us. Uh, at, at the start of every season, we, we, so we get a, a payment now, and we get another payment in, in January. Uh, if we were in League Two, just about now, we'd be, we'd be receiving two hundred and forty thousand pounds. That's what the Premier League uh, graciously give us. If we're in League One. We would receive, we will receive three hundred and sixty thousand pounds, and another one in January. Does anybody want to have a guess what the championship clubs will get? The championship clubs are getting 2.4 million. So that's, if, if, if you push that down to teams like Tottenham and Ipswich and all those teams that in Derby County who want to get back into the championship, you can imagine the type of playing budgets and the type of resources they've already got. Um, that's what we're competing with. So it's, it, it, this year's budget is really tough. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll work hard to, to make it work and continue to make it work. The reason I'm saying this, of course, is if you're not already a member of the trust, I've just explained yeah, the, 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 the trust are providing almost a million pounds in funding to the club this season and have regularly uh, funded them by. Uh, 100, 150,000. So if you're not a member of the trust, please join because it really, really does make a difference and certainly making a difference uh, this season. Um, those are the highlights. I'm happy to answer any questions, but no idea how long I've been talking for. So, but if you've got any questions, even on what, what I've talked about or anything else that you want to ask, very happy to answer. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Uh, we'll be getting, be getting card payments in the group, or we'll just cash. You guys have been putting um, the cabling in today to allow for card payments in the kiosks. I think there's one kiosk, and, and please don't ask me which one, that we're struggling mm -hmm. with more, more than others. But, but yes, you'll be able to pay with card in the ground. Questions? Um, the cost of living crisis is hitting families all across the country now and obviously down here as well. Have you considered making any special arrangements to try and attract families up here on a regular basis, but who are going to struggle to match match they feed you know income at the gate on a regular basis because they they have to pay fuel, cost of food and so on. Um, are you are you taking advantage of consideration for your budget? Um, so the budget's all already been set, the budget's are set in, in kind of March time. Um, what, what we have reacted to is when people have um, found us and said, we're really going to struggle this season, can you help in any way? We've always tried to help. Generally with season tickets, um, we, we've had, uh, but we've, we're doing it on a case-by-case -case basis. So if somebody comes to us and says, I'm struggling, um, we'll, we'll, we'll do everything we can to help. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so more that, you know, I, that, that's really thing. I know that's what the club does, particularly with the guys, and stuff like that. But, but these, these sort of families sometimes aren't going to know that when to come or even know to ask the question. You do get those families, you know. I just want to go to something, something that they support in some way with the people. Oh. Difficult, I know. That's a really tough question, and I'm delighted that Carrie has put a hand up to answer it for you. Um, so, what we've got the challenge we've had this season is we have to be specially licensed by the FCM to get financial ombudsman. It takes quite a lot of time to get that credit, so we're not able to do the direct debits at the moment. So, what we've done is we've worked with the families that obviously we've touched with this to work out, but what 
This form of payment plans, they pay for a couple of games at a time and then they issue those tickets when they do it. They were more than happy to facilitate that. They are more than to make that priority. It is very labor intensive because it's not nice to make doing it. But we'll certainly do what we can to assist. Yeah, but that is the last day that you're going to contact with you. It is because of course it's so labor intensive. If you put it out there, we want people to come to us. It's going to be very, very difficult for us to, to, to do it. So we you know, the people that have contacted us and, you know, we've absolutely facilitated something. The good thing is the next scene, so we're looking at ticketing platforms to see if this one is got better functionality for the um, stadium. One of the tick boxes to that is a direct connection. So, hopefully the next scene, so a new coach for the ticketing system, we will be partnered with a third party that can help with the ticketing system. Yeah, so that will have the credit license on that. So, when we launch the season tickets for next season, we'll absolutely not share and take that work away as well. Yeah. yeah. You kind of slip your shoulder out to someone else. Yeah. But, um, that's what we yeah. The plan is exactly in place for next season. We'll just wait for the plan to facilitate this season. Yeah. Okay. The one does uh, the one one that can send in. Okay. Um, so, just uh, some names. Uh, what are the benefits of a new non exec practice? So, the benefit. Yeah. Um, well, between them, they, they have considerable amounts of experience in, in business. So we, we, we recruited three new non execs, and, and they all have quite different skills. Um, so uh, Clive is, is, is a very skilled uh, accountant, has worked at the very top of that profession, uh, and, and is extremely clever at um, interpreting numbers, but also in, in Applying the, the, the governance and, and the compliance matters that, that wrapped around finance. And we didn't, we had a lot of people here at the, at the club who were good with numbers, but we needed that compliance piece. And, and, and also because of the, the, some of the things we've already talked about, Clive is extremely skilled at measuring and assessing risk, financial risk. So we've got that in our pocket when we, when we need to say, you know, the numbers aren't looking too clever, Clive. What's your view? He'll, he'll be able to do this for us. So that's, that's a really important uh, skill. Um, we've got Jeremy Tipper, who is an entrepreneur uh, and invests in a, a lot of other companies. And what we're looking for, for from Jeremy is some really cool ideas, things all of the kind of out of the box things that we're not thinking about. But he's going to help us with, and he's done some great work already at the academy, um, and he's introducing some of the software that we're um, installing at the moment. Um, and Jonathan Hart is a uh, very successful <coughs> businessman. He, he, he was CEO of Thornton's, he was CEO of Dixon's, he was. Uh, um, one, the, one other big national company. So it's like Captain Nero. And so he's bringing all of that experience that he's got as a CEO to, uh, to, to try and just beef up the, the, the business acumen that we, we, we can operate with. It's just something different, is the honest truth. Does that answer? We don't know, we don't read it out if it's rude. Tangible. Tangible benefits. Well, they come to every board meeting and we don't pay them. It's a tangible benefit. <laughs> 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 the good people have around. So, so on. Guys, um, I just wonder how, in, how important are football fans that uh, have excellent support stuff uh, and live in a bar like myself? Outside of the locality, so overseas, overseas support. How important are they to the club? How important are they? Yeah, how relevant, how important. Really, really, really important. We, so when the trust, the supporters' trust started, uh, it, it was primarily people who didn't live in Exeter who, who started the trust uh, and wanted to contribute something to the club, <coughs> even though they couldn't come to games. We we have members all over the world, in South America. Um, particularly in Brazil, in the United States, in South Africa. Um, and, and a lot of, we've got two members in particular who live in uh, 
um, I believe it's El Paso, that donate two season tickets every year uh, that we donate to, to a charity that we support called the ECI. So um, we've got somebody in Switzerland who does make something very similar, provides season tickets. So they're massively important and they're spreading the word. They are spreading the word. So it's, it's, it's great to have the, the, the people dot around. It's good fun when I send out a newsletter. The, the software kind of highlights where the newsletter is being delivered, and there's just little red dots all over the world. It's fantastic. Hey, um, just want to say because you forgot to say it uh, 160 pounds to be raised by the raffle tonight. So, thank you very much indeed. And that's going to go towards paying for the induction poll. I think I said that right at the new Cliff Hill Ferry. So, thank you for your contributions tonight. It, it looks like one they're doing the, the anthems. Any, any, any last questions before we uh, before I, I let you enjoy the football? Well, are they going to finish? Where's that? Are they going to finish? What's your prediction? Twelve. Anyone else? Okay, thank you ever so much. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the book, what did you say?